Welcome to another episode of Cleaning Up the Profits, dishing the dirt on cleaning business success, where we talk with real cleaning business owners and industry experts about what it takes to make it in the competitive world of professional cleaning. Welcome back to another episode of Cleaning Up the Profits. I'm your host, Melissa Homer, Chief Cleaning Officer of Microfiber Wholesale. I am a professional cleaning expert with over 20 years in the professional cleaning industry, and I get the honor of interviewing our guests, real cleaning business owners and industry experts who have a diverse background of years in business and size of organizations, but the one thing they have in common is they are experts at their craft, having built their business from the ground up and bringing you real life from the trenches advice that you can use today. So without further ado, let's introduce our guest for today, Catherine Boyce from Sir Grout and Mapro, our multi-business franchise owner. Um, Catherine, welcome to our show. Thank you. Our audience gets a chance to know you a little bit and understand how lucky they are to hear from you today. First, I'd love you to share just a little bit about the type of businesses you own. Things like the names of your businesses, what they do, how big they are, just so they get a sense of how awesome and successful you are. Well, currently I own a Made Pro that I've had for 17 years. And last year in February, we opened the doors of Sir Grout. Um, I do have a business partner for Sir Grout. So it's a little over a year that we've been in business with Sir Grout. Oh, and how big are they? Uh, Made Pro is just under a million dollar business and Sir Grout's on track to do seven to 800,000 this year. Awesome, nice work for year one. Whew. Um, now, um, for those that may not know those brands, can you explain what each of those brands do? Just real quick. Um, Made Pro is a residential and commercial cleaning company. Um, we take care of people's houses and small offices. And Sir Grout is in hard surface restoration. So we go in and we take hold and turn it back to new. So um, tile floors, the grout in the floors, um, showers, bathtubs, uh, stone surfaces, we make it all brand new again. That's awesome. I love that. Um, for those in the professional cleaning industry, for the record, if you are running any sort of residential or commercial service, you absolutely need to track down a restoration service like Sir Grout in your marketplace. And if you're near Catherine's in Florida, absolutely do track her down because she knows what she's doing. Um, restoration is not the work of commercial residential cleaning. It is its own thing. And consumers don't know the difference and they will push you to restore things that you can't restore. You're there to maintain. And if you don't have a restoration company in your back pocket to point them at, they're going to come to you with complaints. So Catherine is doing God's work out there. She's fixing the things that the rest of us can't and turning them back to the way they belong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that work. Uh, or in your text too. Um, so what we're going to do today is talk about your keys to success and what you've learned along the way. So hopefully that other people that are struggling with their business can learn the cheat codes from you as opposed to learning it the hard way. So my first question to you is going to be, what brought you to the cleaning industry? How did you decide you wanted to open, it sounds like first your Made Pro and then your um, Sir Grout? Well, Made Pro was many moons ago and it was, um, I was an accountant by trade and I just wanted my own business. I wanted out of corporate America. Even way back then I wanted out. <laughs> Um, so I started looking at different businesses. So it wasn't that I was a neat freak. It wasn't that I was knew anything about cleaning. I knew nothing. I knew nothing. Um, thank God for the likes of, of made pro corporate that held my hand through all of it. Um, but, uh, so I opened it just to have, to become a small business. Sir Grout came around because of things that were broken at made pro. Um, and I kept seeing things that, you know, a cleaning company couldn't resolve and I needed to get some answers. And when I found the answers, um, I needed to figure out, okay, well, I've got the answers. How do I fix this? And Sir Grout was presented right about that exact same time. So it just kind of all fell into place. Uh, like I said, on that one, I got a business, business partner. You know, and uh, it it's, uh, makes so much sense that you say that because uh, anyone that is in professional cleaning knows, especially if you're in residential, but in commercial as well, there is no avoiding consumers coming to you and saying, hey, I know you're here to maintain, 
But yikes, this surfaces, you know, seen better days. It's getting to the end of its wear life. It needs some restoration. Can you, can you, can you, can you fix it? And if you don't have that other service in your back pocket, it's really hard to be, no, I'm a maintenance cleaning person. This is not what we do. And having that come up over and over and over again, I can absolutely see why you would be so smart as to diversify and bring in that restoration arm to your you know, suite of services so that you can take those customers you're maintaining and restore for them as well. So stinking smart. Um, and uh, for those that are looking uh, as older clean companies on how to uh, breathe new life into your aging business, uh, absolutely looking at different types of restoration opportunities, whether it's glass res restoration or stone restoration or tile restoration, any of those types of services, they go hand in hand with uh, traditional cleaning beautifully. And you're living proof of that considering the fact that you already did 800K in your first year opening of the doors. Nicely done, by the way. Well done. Um, and that probably has a lot to do with having that ripe customer base from your existing business to be able to help give you that momentum you need. Uh, I'm presuming you were able to, or was that all raw new sales? Or were you able to use some of that existing customer base as well? I would have liked to have seen a lot more, but yeah, I definitely did have clients from MadePro that used our services. So I, I, I was hoping for more. <laughs> well, give them time. They, they're, they're not going anywhere and they're going to continue to realize their stuff's, you know, getting trashed by the year. We'll get them. Um, so now we know how you got into things. And I actually, honestly, I love having people on here that didn't have a background in cleaning. Because people think you can't get into the professional cleaning industry unless you were a neat freak, unless you were a maid first. And that's just simply not true. You can be someone like yourself who said, this is a smart business opportunity. I see this as a sustainable, growable business that is the hours I want, is a service I know people need, is something I think I'd be good at managing, I'm good with people, whatever. And decide, I just want to do this because it's a smart business, not because I'm necessarily like, you know, this big clean freak. So I love having you on here for that because I think there's so many people that think, oh, I can't get into cleaning. I'm not a cleaning expert. I don't love to clean my own house. Heck, I hate cleaning my own house. Honestly, I think people like you actually become the best business owners for a clean company because you've been the consumer. You don't want to clean. You're not neurotically attached to every scrap of dirt. You look at this as a business and how would you experience it as a consumer who hates cleaning and wants to outsource it? I think it gives you so much better insights and a, so much better connection to your customer than the neat freaks that are themselves, you know, saying to the customer, you know, you, you should want it cleaner than that, <laughs> you know, and they're making their own problems because they have their own attachment to how they think the service should be. So um, I, 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 I thank you for doing that and uh, uh, modeling that for our listeners. Um Absolutely. Let's go ahead and help you become more relatable to our customers. Because I think a lot of people watching this don't have mil a million plus sales in two businesses and thinking, you know, how do I get there? I want them to know that, you know, uh, you put your pants on one leg at a time like everybody else and they can get there too. So let's talk about your rookie years. Ta let's talk about when you were new. Can you share what were some of the big challenges you hit in year one? Some things you remember that, you know, pulling your hair out about. Sir girl, it's easier to remember because it's only been a year. Um, but it does go back to Made Pro. Um, the biggest the biggest thing in the beginning and throughout all of um, your career as a business owner is staffing. It, it's just getting the right staff in place and learning to drop the staff that needs to go away quickly. Um, you know, even knowing that from Made Pro and Sir Grouch, you know, because we have less staff, you kind of want to nurture them a little differently because there's, you know, there's only a handful of you all. And just holding on to the wrong person is it, just demonstrative. It's, it's horrible. You've got to get rid of them. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's something that every business owner has to contend with. Um, just, and then just procedures, just learning the the procedures, making sure that you know what your staff is doing so that you can coach and develop them. Um, and it wasn't rocket science for me with with Made Pro versus Sir Grout. Sir Grout learning, you know, about caulk and epoxy grout and sealing and etching and honing and blah, you know, I mean, these are, are things that I had no clue about. I mean, I knew how to mop the floor. You know, I knew how to dust. I didn't want to do it, but I knew how to do it. I did not know how to cut a shower out. So just learning policies and procedures and, and how you do things properly 
so that you can teach people. Um, those are about the two biggest things. And it's, it's, I think any business, those are probably both two of the biggest things, just learning the business and learning your people. I was going to say, I think, uh, it is probably a universal truth of all small businesses learning how to identify what employees are keepers and which ones to cut loose fast and are, you know, uh, dragging your culture down or whatever is going on. That that's just life in terms of owning any business. And so I think you're spot on that that's going to be a number one for a lot of people. I'm curious uh, sharing for our listeners that are struggling with that and trying to better get a better sense of it. Um, you know, going off, I'm going to tangent off my usual questions and hit it because we're just talking about it already. What are some of the things that you found that help you figure out quicker, gee, this is someone I should be, you know, nurturing and keeping and helping grow here, or this is someone I need to help find another future at someone other organization real fast. <laughs> is there anything you're starting to figure out is like your, you know, your quick hits of like, ah, this person probably not gonna be my fit. Each person's unique and, and, and each situation's unique, but there's really specific things like um, somebody that's charty, somebody that's, that's just, that's not a good situation no matter which business. So um, obviously they have no respect for the client or the business owner or even themselves if they can't be somewhere on time. Um, and that's not the one off where you're stuck on a highway somewhere or your, your car actually really did break down. Um, it, personality, negativity, uh, those are big things. If you don't have any, if, if the person's not customer service related or oriented, excuse me, that's a problem because both my businesses, we're walking into people's castles. It's their homes. That's where their secrets are. That's where, you know, they cry in the corner if they need to. That's where they pray. That's where they eat. That's where they love. When we walk into those houses, we have to be very conscious of that. And so keeping an eye on the people that you have and their personalities and how they, their behaviors. Um, Cause if they're behaving a certain way in your office with people, chances are it's going to show up in your client's home as well. Um, and if you don't think it, it, if you don't think it happens, I've seen videos. <laughs> it, it happens. It happens. You know, uh, it, it's, it, it, you know, you're, you're so spot on. And I hope that people listening caught this one of, you know, this, this, I think it's, I think it's Maya Angelou that said it. I think Maya, Maya Angelou is the one that said it, where she said, when people show you who they are, believe them. It's so true. It's so easy to be struggling to find staff and wanting to see the best in people and trying to ignore the red flags you're seeing because you need that worker. But if they're talking smack in your office and being negative and, you know, um, acting a certain way within that office and they showed you who you who they are by George they're acting that way in front of the clients in front of your coworkers, uh probably more so because they're not in front of the boss and they feel even more free to be themselves so yeah absolutely uh that is a huge issue um for commercial and residential I know let people like to think that residential cleaning oh we're in front of the commercial customer we have to be friendlier but my, you know, night crew, my cleaning company, they can be whatever that then because we're commercial. That's not true because the coworkers matter and how they treat each other matters. And, you know, uh, they may not have a customer to mess up in front of. But if they're bringing down the morale of everyone in the building that night trying to clean that space, that matters as much as them talking smack in front of a customer. So uh, I think you're spot on that paying attention to how people behave in the office and um, they, they that be one of the guides as to who you want to help build your team. I think that's huge. So thank you. Um, let's go ahead and uh, continue to make you a little relatable for a little bit longer. And then we're going to get to your successes, I promise. Can you share just for the fun of our audience, any rookie mistake that you look back at and like, you know, get that like pang of embarrassment of I can't believe I did that. You know, is there any rookie mistakes you remember from your early years that you're like, oh, God, <laughs> we've learned since then? Scheduling errors, um, you know, not showing up at a client's house because I made a mistake and didn't put them where they were supposed to be. I mean, that's a killer because um, that is all me. Um, or, you know, your staff did as well. Anything wild that happened at home where you're like, oh, gosh, <laughs> you know, first year mistakes type stuff. 
Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, with the Made Pro, we've, we've done all kinds of damage um, because people have brought in their own products, not the products that we have, which are all safe. Um, as far as the restoration portion, basically, it, if we damage it, we can fix it. So it's not so bad there, you know, because we're fixing it anyway. But on the made pro problem, oh yeah, we've scratched sinks, we've scratched on ovens, we've scratched the inside of a toilet. Um, and they've, every single person that did it was using something that was not authorized. And green scrubbies, uh, you know, uh, bleach on a floor. None of our products have bleach. Bleach is a high alkali. There's no reason to have bleach in in a house. Um, and yeah, we've damaged rugs and, and you know, that's that's the pros. That's not us. And even 18 years ago, we, we didn't need bleach. I mean, but still, we paid for people's carpets and rugs and towels because of things like that. Um, other warning things, you know, not reading work orders and letting an, a dog escape because they didn't realize there was a dog when they opened the door. And then, you know, they spend a half hour chasing animals around town. Um, that's always a little bit stressful. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, um, thank you for sharing those because those, all the things you listed are just so real life. Um the challenge of convincing your staff not to go rogue and b take their own stuff into cleans is so real. I have seen that across the industry. That's you know not unique to you. Uh, the the more you can reinforce to your staff the importance of sticking with what's in the kit because it's been vetted, it is so critical. And I think you know sharing those stories of hey you know. We had someone decided to go on their own and get a green scrubby because they decided they were going to bring more firepower to help clean. They had good intentions, but this is a picture of what the sink looked like after they did it. <laughs> this is why we vet what we put in the kit and we tell you to stick to it because we picked things we know you can't trash stuff with. I think that's so important to have that conversation. And I think when you're new, people don't necessarily feel as confident in their product selection. They don't necessarily feel like they know what they're doing as much. They might turn a little bit of a blind eye when their employees are bringing stuff in on the sides. But once you get a better understanding of what you're using and know what's safe and what's not, you got to put the hammer down. And I think you've done that. And clearly those problems are mostly going away because you've been in business for so long. But it, it it's a real issue of trying to convince people. No, they're still doing it. Oh, no. Come on, give us some light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> I walked into my office just this past weekend. And on the desk of my quality control supervisor was a bag of green scrubbies. And I about had a kitten. I, I was just like, what? <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> but they're like, well, you know, so I, they, there was a note. I'm like, these need to be returned. These never go out in the field. And it's just each new person you have, you have to coach them because I don't know why they think green scrubbies are a thing. It's like, shouldn't exist. They really shouldn't. Even with third route, we don't use green scrubbies. So the green scrub scrubbies, fun fact, those are actually designed to strip finish. So <laughs> we, you see people using them and cleaning all the time because, again, they're... the. No, I should not be mean. I'm not going to say because they're idiots because I want to say because they're idiots, but I'm going to stop myself because they haven't been educated on how to take care of services properly because we don't teach enough about cleaning in schools and in science classes, there's so much opportunity to teach people the chemistry behind cleaning, but we don't. Uh, so people wing it at Home Depot and they say, oh, look, this white pad's for scrubbing. This green pad must be for scrubbing too. Awesome. But they're really meant to strip finishes. Therefore, when you want to clean wood to refinish it and you put, you know, paint there and stuff on and you scrub off that finish, that's what the green pad is for, is to strip finish and then go put new stuff on. If you use it on anything you care about, it is going to absolutely trash it. Um, it's like those black pads there for like stripping up floor finish. Those are also stripping pads. They are meant to strip the finish off floors. But again, people say, oh, look, it looks like a scrubbing pad. It must be like this one I'm on the back of my kitchen sponge. It's like, no, -uh. <laughs> different game. <laughs> no, those black pads, we, those black, yeah, those black pads, we, we take down travertine with those. You know, so we take it down a whole level to to get it, you know, to get etching out. So, yes, you don't want to mess with that. Yeah, Black Pad's like standing. Uh, by the way, to take it down for people that aren't in the restoration world. She literally re-sands and hones and grades stone as part of her restoration service. So if someone drops something like acid on um, marble or travertine and they've created pitting in the stone, her organization comes out and 
resands down to that lowest level so it's smooth again. Um, and um, that that so that's aggressive pads. You don't want to be scrubbing someone's tub with that. <laughs> no, and acid can be as simple as as lemon juice and orange juice on a marble or travertine counter. I mean, you know, this it should not be on a counter in a kitchen. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, marble and travertine should not be a counter surface. You know, uh, you know, I know we're we're veering sideways a little bit, but I'm thinking a lot of people watching will appreciate. Uh, I could have someone to vent to, uh, as a uh, especially as a restoration specialist, how many terrible choices people are encouraged to make when it comes to remodeling their homes lately. You know, it, it used to be we had these very durable ceramic tile floors and practical countertops and you could maintain it. And now, you know, whoever said marble belongs in the kitchen at all or travertine belongs in the kitchen at all, they're acid sensitive and you're making tomato sauce and lemonade and, you know, white wine sauce all the time and it's all acidic. Like, that's just like a recipe for disaster. You know, um, and you just wonder who on HGTV said, yeah, that's a great plan and started this mess, you know? And river rock floors. That's the new one. Everybody's putting river rock floors in and they're they're just being ripped up because what's river rock? It's a natural stone. And what are you doing? Shampoo, conditioner, uh, shaving cream, hard water, calcium, um, all that stuff is hitting the river rock and it's, it's etching and it's becoming dull. And people are like, what can you do? And it's like, well, we can't regrout because it's not square. So you can't regrout. You, I mean, and, and you've just etched your floor. It, it's like the worst. It's so pretty when it goes in. It's the worst product you can put on a shower floor. Thank you for saying that out loud. I'm going to make sure we uh, cut that one to a reel so the public can hear it. I see people putting that in. It's all on their Instagram and like how beautiful this bathroom is. Show a picture two years later. Like, I mean, that's the thing. Like everyone gets this new and model stuff and then, Cleaning companies like our world are tasked with maintaining it and it's not maintainable. And I uh, thank you for saying that out loud. Um, the ones that drive me bonkers are marble showers in places where people have hard water, the river rock. Oh my God. Um, that's also just, I, I seen it as like floors, not even just their showers. They people have it like in weird little like hallways or bathrooms. And then you're like, try, how do I mop this? Cause every mop is going over that. Good luck. <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, um, so much uneven slate stone and things that they can't navigate over. Um, there's just so many bad life choices or, um, you know, a bright white grout with no sealant on it in the front foyers. Uh, you know, it's just like, ah, so uh, at, at some point, uh, every one of these gray hairs is dedicated to somebody at HGTV. I'm just saying. Oh, and I can I, you and I can go back and forth on what not to do when you're when you're remodeling your house. Honestly, like. So we're going to do this interview and say I'm target because I don't want to get too distracted. But I'm going to invite you back because you just said something. We're totally going to get together at a separate show. Just warning all of my listeners, this is happening. Me, you, glass of wine, griping about all the terrible decisions people are making about their houses and what not to do remodel. I think we need to be a show, especially since you have the restoration angle. We can go back and forth for hours on the things that just people put in and they have no idea what they're getting themselves into. So, yes, this is a show. I'm, I'm declaring it. I, I'm, I'm down with it. I mean, to restore a travertine, 800 square feet travertine floor, $6,000 to restore it. Jesus Christ, is that much? That's exactly. It's like, why would you want to do that? I have security, baby. I love it. That's awesome. I can go make that paper. But, man, we, let's see some people from it to first. All right. <laughs> That's awesome. So... Getting us back on track, though, because we got that show. Now everyone knows there's a preview coming attractions. Let's focus on this show for a bit. Um, we've talked about some of the rookie mistakes. We talked about things that have gone wrong. Let's talk about some of the stuff that goes right. Can you share some of your early memories of like when you're like, I've turned the corner. I think I'm getting this. Some moments where you're like you're proud of what you remember or you've really started to feel like you're getting grounded as a business owner and some of the lessons you've learned that you feel like you're making I don't really have any defining moments because each time I think that I'm there, then the rug gets pulled out from under me. So I really try to just stay humble and <laughs> because it, it, you boast and, and, that, and the virus hits, you know, I mean, that would have been my first million, my first million dollar year was the year the virus hit. And yeah, there goes this giant rug um, and there was no genie on it. it was, seriously. Um, but don't do that. Don't take it. Uh, I'm going to challenge you. Don't do that. The, um, there's a temptation to say, I didn't 
hit a milestone because the rug got pulled. You didn't. You did hit a milestone, but then the rug got pill- pulled. You hit this level and then you hit the next one and then you hit the next one. So go ahead and recognize those moments for what they were, which was exceptional accomplishments. It's just once you've leveled up to level two, the new dragons come out. You know, it's like when any video game, you know, you defeated dragon one, take that moment and be proud of yourself and then get a level two and the bigger dragon comes out, you know, and that doesn't mean you weren't good at it. It just means you were awesome at level one and now you got to get to the level two. So go ahead and some of those early moments. And yes, rugs got pulled afterwards. That's fine. But be proud of yourself for what those moments that happened. Any you want to share? Well, I mean, I think especially in, in a business like MadePro where you have many, many staff members, you know, that the first time that you're able to actually bring in somebody to run your office, um, that's a really defining moment where you've broken even and now you don't have to be the person in the office 40 hours a week um, after, of course, after you're done training your staff and then bringing the second one in. Um, it, so that's pretty to me, that's kind of a huge thing um, because it gives you. It gives you what you want when you open a business. I don't think anybody opens a business to work the business 24 um, seven. And if you do, you're you're better than me, because that's certainly not what I wanted to do. Um, um, so that's a huge, that's huge. Um, and just, you know, just hitting your, your key ratios and playing that game, you know, okay. Like whenever you have a goal each month, um, just busting through that goal and, and then maintaining that, uh, those are always fun. Um, with Sir Grout, you know, it's the same thing, just, just focusing on closing ratios and, and, you know, I'm a money, I'm, I'm a numbers person. So those that's what's fun to me is just watching those numbers and making sure that they're being maintained and broken that's awesome actually it it, if it feeds to a question i'm going to ask a little bit that i may ask out of order because we're just already talking about it you know when it comes to running your own business there's a lot of things that you can decide i love and i want to do or things you can decide i'm doing this for now until my business can support me outsourcing it because i can't stand this part of the business and it sounds like you already identified several things that you made that decision on of you didn't want to be stuck in daily operations. You wanted to be able to be that executive owner that's more overseen, not have to be there 24-7 with the business. You identified that you like the finances. That's something you wanted to maintain and focus on where some people may hate the books and you know get overwhelmed by the numbers. So I'm curious, how did you go through that process of figuring out you know, what you wanted to keep and what you wanted to get rid of was it a matter of just organically realizing i hate this i want this gone or was there a process of self-reflection and looking at you know what you want did you have a vision when you got into this of what parts of the business you wanted to keep um i I think it all goes it's 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 actually very different for both businesses because i would like to tell you i don't like people and so i didn't want to deal with staff but then at Sir Grout, the thing that I love more than anything is going out and doing sales. And we literally go into people's homes. So all day long, I'm around brand new people. So it, it's, you know, they're, it's, it's different. Um, I don't know that there's really anything defining about it. Um, I, I believe just having to deal with the day to day, you know, people calling out or doing scheduling changes, it just got boring. And I, I, it wasn't challenging for me anymore. I could just maneuver through a dispatch board and it was just like, you know, it wasn't Tetris anymore. Was, I just knew what to do with my eyes closed. And so um, when I get bored, that's never a good situation because then I do things like go out and buy another business <laughs> you know, to alleviate the boredom or get another dog or something, you know. <laughs> like, um, with Sir Grout, um, it wasn't so much that, that, I know, I know what I'm capable of. So I had to bring a business partner in for Sir Grout because I'm not capable of being the person in there cutting out the shower. I'm, I'm going to be 58. I don't want to be on my knees cutting out showers and floating floors and, um, you know, using big buffers and, and, you know, when you're honing and polishing, I, that's not my thing. So my thing is the people and obviously the books straight across for everything. Did I answer that question? You did perfectly, which is you identified what you wanted and you went for it. And, you know, uh, you took into consideration the long game in terms of uh, as you're aging, picking uh, business 
part of the business that you can grow with you and not, you know, strain your body and tire you out and all smart decisions. Um, and recognizing that liking people doesn't mean liking everyone. <laughs> um, you can be someone that's wonderful in front of the customers on the sales end of thing and be terrible employee management. Or you can be amazing in front of the employees and stammer in front of the customers. Um, it, they are not, those are not universal, you know, skills that translate across everything. It's so important to be self-aware and know where you have patience and where you don't. And I love that you are able to do that well. Um, and I think a lot of business owners out there that struggle, mostly struggle because they're not good at looking in the mirror and being honest about, well, I'm good with people. I, I, I charm my customers all the time. It's like, but that's not the same as having patience for your employees. So um, you may want to work on that part, you know, and uh, it, it's it's rare to find people that are self-aware enough to know, hey, just because I can, you know, talk a good game in front of clients doesn't mean I necessarily have that endless well of patience I need to be an excellent manager and recognize that, you know, I may need an employee manager that has a skill set that I don't have. Um, so uh, I love that you are able to see that in yourself. Um, I'm kind of cheating using that as a segue. So I'm just giving <laughs> advice for someone as a, a, a business you know, to make sure they have that self-reflection. What advice would you give to people that are getting into the cleaning business? Some of the new owners, you know, you've been at this for 18 years, I think you said, um, you know, um, what would you share for people starting out, you know, help them avoid some headaches and heartaches, the new ones. What advice would you give them to help them on their journey? First, you have to figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at. Um, because if you, if you don't have that, uh, my one thing that really triggers me when I'm speaking to new owners is somebody that's not keeping an eye on their books. And I, I understand a lot of people are not number people and they don't understand it. Okay. That's fine. That needs to be given to somebody else because every single month you need to have your benchmarks. And if you don't have them, um, you're going to have some big problems. You know, if you don't know what your attrition is, if you don't know your closing percentage, if you don't know what you've got sitting in the bank, if you don't know what your your um, payroll percentages are, that's that's that can kill you and shut your business down very quickly. Um, so you need to find your strengths and, you know, anything that you're weak in or, or something that you need to develop. You need to be on top of that immediately. That's not something that you can pigeonhole. Um as far as cleaning, you know, it's, there's always people like you, like if it's part of the cleaning aspect, like me, I had no idea about anything cleaning wise. And so who did I go to people like you, you know, what do I do for this? What do I do for that? How do I handle this? Um, know who it is that you can go to and make sure that you've got people you can bounce stuff off of. Part of the reason why I like being in the franchise industry, having actually being a franchise versus, you know, Catherine's cleaning service is because I've got all those other owners out there that I can bounce questions off of on those ends of the business. And um, so you need to know your resources. You need to know your weaknesses and strengths. You need to not hide from the things that you're not strong at. Um, and what you're not strong at, you either develop it or you make sure you have the proper person to take care of it for you so that you're not destroying your business. I, that is all such good advice. Um, I think, you know, you pointed out something that I, I keep trying to preach that I think is so important is having a network. You know, as a franchise, it's kind of a cheat code because you get those like-minded individuals kind of handed to you on a silver platter right from the get-go. Um, if you're running Catherine's cleaning business, it can be lonely out there. Um, finding your peeps, finding organizations and local peer groups is so important as a new business owner to have like-minded people to share your pain with and your frustrations with and get ideas from because, you know, let's be honest, your buddy that's, you know, an accountant or uh, is uh, some, you know, marketing person, they're not going to be able to relate to your daily struggles the way another small business owner is going to be able to relate. And they may love you and be a good friend and want to take you out for a drink and say, I'm sorry, you had a bad day at work, but they're not going to be able to get it the way another small business owner is getting to and be able to give you advice the way that other owner is going to. And, and that's absolutely true. I mean, that's so true, Melissa. Uh, other people that are not business owners really do not understand it. They don't understand the day-to-day -day wins and, and struggles. They just don't get it. And um, 
being an entrepreneur, there's such a small percentage of the world actually are entrepreneurs. So you've really got to zero in on uh, if you if you are, you know, Jane's cleaning company, then get yourself to one of the BNIs and, and get yourself to some other groups that have other small business owners. If you're not with a franchise, um, it's 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 actually kind of funny what people think you do as a business owner. It's, it's very humorous. Um, if you actually were to quiz your friends, hey, what do you think I do in my business? You know, half the people think I'm out there cleaning. It's like, no, it'll be a no. <laughs> You know, uh, you're so spot on. It's like those memes where it's like, you know, how I see myself, how my mom sees me, how the world, what I'm actually doing. It's so true of people don't get the day to day struggle of running a business is so many hats at once. You know, um, ideally, you're not providing the service that the business provides because you're the captain of the ship and you're trying to steer the ship. If you're out there swabbing decks, this, you know, the, the captain's wheel spinning. So, you know, you ideally aren't actually providing the service. You're taking customer service calls. You're tracking down and recruiting employees. You're dealing with legal crap. You're dealing with workers cop. You're dealing with, um, you know, no call, no shows and rescheduling people, you know, managing the books, buying supplies. There's so many daily things that have to be managed that have absolutely nothing to do with actually getting to someone's house and, you know, vacuuming their carpets. So um, I, I love that you point that out because I think, it's so important to talk to people that get it rather than, you know, your peers that love you, but they have no clue. <laughs> so that that's awesome. Um, for the people that have been in business for a while, um, you know, the owners that have been at this five plus years, maybe longer, or someone like yourself been in your decade plus, but they're burnt out. They're frustrated. Their business isn't going where they want it to go. What would you give them as advice as a more seasoned owner to get their business back in the game, get their head back in the game, how would you help get them back on track? There's a couple of different things. Um, you know, you own a business, so you really need to make some hard decisions. Most people don't own a business to own the business for their entire life. So if you're really that far gone, then you need to really sit down and think, is it time for me to sell my business? Um, you know, because that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate thing. So um, you know, selling a business is, is a possibility. Um, if, if, you know, people that don't take vacations, that that's going to kill you as a business owner. I've coached several people. Oh, I can't get away from it. Are you crazy? You have to get away from it. If you don't get away from it, you're going to burn out. Um, you, you know, I, I travel probably, probably about 40 days out of the year. I'm, I, and I'm not talking weekends. I'm talking travel. Um, you know, when the when the virus broke out, I was in Bali. In September, I'm going to be in Kenya. Um, I, I, I've done, you know, Croatia and BVI and all these different places. And I go on a couple trips a year. And it's very important. If you can't do trips, then spa days. Or for the gentleman, if you don't like spa, go out and make sure you're golfing and doing your racquetball and you're taking time away from the office. Um, I've never understood ever ever understood anybody that has to work more than 40 hours in the cleaning industry i don't get it um something's being done wrong if you're if you're working more than 40 hours uh because it is not brain surgery it's it's not selling houses it's 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 a business that is generally monday through friday unless of course you're in the commercial end but in in restoration and in cleaning that's normally monday through friday you know, eight o'clock to five o'clock and you should be punching out. If you're not out there cleaning, your work should be done uh, with the exception of if you're newer and you know, you might have to pick up a couple sales calls to build your business. So burnout's huge. Um, I, I mean, there's many times where I wanted to throw in the towel. And at that point you pick up the phone and you call your girlfriend or your, or, you know, and, and cry tears, drink a bottle of wine, um, you know, hit the spa, hit some golf balls, whatever you've got to do to get back in the game. Or if it continues, make a decision. You know, what do I need to do as far as, you know, do I stay in the game? You are so spot on as to trying to re you know, put your own face mask on first. I think it's one of the things that is so hard for people as business owners, as uh, parents, as so many things in life. We think that we're better serving the people around us 
if we just go, 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 go. But that's not reality. You have to recharge the batteries. You have to plug the cell phone in and recharge it if it's going to work. And, you know, that temptation to work yourself into the ground because somehow that's going to make the business go faster is actually going to make it go slower eventually because you're making terrible decisions because you're burnt out. Um, and I love that you've prioritized travel. Um, and I hope you see the world. Um, that's awesome. But, you know, for people that are like, hey, I'm not a world traveler or I don't have the scra scratch for it just yet. That's OK. You mentioned it perfectly. There's so many things you can do that are low budget, but refill your batteries. It can just be time with your family. It can just be whatever the hobby that you're into. It can be you know, chilling out with a, you know, frosty beverage at, you know, at a, you know, beautiful scenic vista of your choosing of that, you know, you know, hang out with some nature and, you know, breathe in some fresh air for a couple hours, take a walk. You know, there's anything that isn't work, 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 you know, trying to all, all day and night to make this business happen. It's not going to happen if you have no energy left. So I think you're spot on. And thank you for saying that. Um, and the other thing I think you said that was, you know, kind of important too, or really important too, is, you know, uh, thinking about selling and the legacy of your business. Um, you know, uh, the reason we buy businesses all across the country is we're trying to work for ourselves and set our own path. We have a vision of something we think we can do and be good at, but the vision isn't, I'm going to be, you know, working up to my last dying day and flop on top of the desk that's you know that's not the reason we're here you know we work to live not live to work you know that business even if it's wildly successful is supposed to be fueling your ability to see the world if you're into travel or spend time with your grandbabies if you're into that or you know uh what you know or uh playing your favorite golf game whatever it is like that's the point of the thing so if you know you aren't thinking about legacy planning and selling that business and setting it up to be eventually profitable enough to get, a, you know, your return on your investment or pass it on to your kids if you're trying to build a family business. You got to think like that early on, because if you've made a business that only you can run and you can't get your fingers out, you've just guaranteed your golden years are going to suck. <laughs> you know, and it, you, you got to keep your eye on that prize for sure. So I thank you for saying that, because I think so many people don't think that way until it's too late. And they've haven't been properly planning for a business that they can get the maximum out of when they sell. Um, and, you know, it's okay to recognize when it's your time to exit or get into a different business venture. I think, you know, you mentioned, you know, being bored and getting other businesses. That's totally valid. I've, you know, in my uh, history of working in clean consulting, I've definitely seen businesses where the owner had clearly had it. <laughs> they were done emotionally, mentally just done. And it wasn't necessarily that they were bad at it or the business was bad. It was just, they're done. And when you're done, you're done. Um, and they were able to move on and new owner with new energy took that business and all the things that were going poorly because the owner was done went like that because someone with new energy was able to get in there with optimism and new energy and you know shed the cynicism and say, I'm going to find a solution for this versus if you're just burnt, <laughs> you're just like, oh, of course this sucks. It always sucks. It's going to continue to suck. And you just sit there and kind of wallow in it uh, versus a new owner to be like, no, I'm not living like this. How could you live like this for this long? And they're like, I'm going to fix it. And they get it, you know? So I, I, I think it's so important to talk. People talk about sales as if it's a dirty word, like it's failure or what happens when you're old. It's like, no, no, the, the win game is building a big, awesome business, selling it and then doing fun, cool stuff. <laughs> like that's, that's the like, I did it. Can you share with me shifting topics a little bit? Something that you think is important about running a clean business that you see other companies, your competitors overlooking and that frustrates you. What's some stuff that you think you see out there that people aren't doing right that you know you do well at your Maypro and your Sir Grout? Well, in particular for Sir Grout and its product, um, you know, I don't know even the other people that have grout in their name uh, walk into to the work they did and they didn't grout, they caulked. Um, caulked? doesn't last long <laughs> it just doesn't and you know if it's an apartment complex or something like that or, or even a rental property cock's okay and it's good around glass and around toilets i mean it's got a, a, a in windows it's got a great purpose been in places like a shower to have another quote-unquote restoration company go in and lowball the price because they're going to put cock in 
versus putting in like a really good epoxy grout, which does the same thing, but looks really, really good and holds up many moves later. Um, that's It's frustrating to see things like that. Um, Sir Grout, it is about our product. It is about our technique. Um, you know, we have purpose-built equipment specifically to do the work that we do. We, um, our color sealant for, for grout is, is actually a proprietary blend. It's, it's, it absorbs into the grout and strengthens the grout and leaves a pretty color on the top. And then teaching people how to clean properly is huge. Um, it's actually shocking how few people actually know how to clean properly. Um, one of the biggest, biggest things that I see and I hear and cleaning companies are notorious for this, sticking that mop in a bucket and slapping it on the floor and just mopping away with really, really high soapy product. Um, that's either really high in alkali or acid. You know, my favorite one nowadays is people throwing vinegar on their grout. It's like, oh yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Um, but you know, that's the new D DIY stuff is this is what we do. We go ahead and we throw vinegar on our floor because Sally Sue, who's got a great blog, is telling you to do it. Um, you know, so one of the things that I see all the time, and I didn't realize that maid services were were really still doing this, is um, mopping with a mop in a bucket. Number one, those mops are gross. They're gross. They're, you're bringing all kinds of stuff in and out of people's homes. Um, second, it's kind of like the same concept of a bathtub. You know, you get into the water and there's dirty water. All your body oils are sitting in the, you know, it's like when I take a bath, I have to shower afterwards because I was sitting on my dirty water. So they're taking their mop bucket and they're mopping your floor and sticking it in and wringing it out. And that water is dirty and it's getting into your grout. And 90% of the grout that's on a floor is contractor grout, which is exceptionally porous. So here's your grout line and here's all this dirt getting in there. And all of a sudden your grout starts changing color. So, um, People need to learn to clean floors properly. Um, and wet mopping is definitely not the way to go. Um, you know, we, actually, microfiber wholesales, they they have specific tools. And I'm not even doing this for you guys. They have specific tools called schmop heads that are one use and done. And they go into a washing machine and they get clean and you're not sticking them in a dirty mop bucket. Um, and it really does a lot of damage. It does a lot, a lot of damage. And, uh, you know, just people bleach you know these cleaning companies that go in with bleach it's it's bleach should not be used period it sits at a 13 on the alkali scale um it, there's nothing good about it if you if you get bleach in a in a shower with grout it actually breaks grout down as well as caulk too so um there's a lot a lot of things that i didn't really realize cleaning companies were doing because made pro does it the right way and then when I'm walking into these houses, like, hey, how are your floors being cleaned? And I'm being told, and I'm just like, okay, you might want to change companies. Yeah, we, we just talked a bunch of technical stuff that people watching may or may not know. But I think I want to sort of put a bow on it of understanding the service you're in and getting educated on it. The thing I think that I th see most cleaning companies making the mistake of is they come at this business too organically. They're like, oh... I love to clean. My mom taught me to clean well. I started cleaning for people that don't know any better and they said, look good. So I must be good at cleaning. Cool. I'm going to teach everyone else to clean like me and I'm never going to do a lick of research. That is a recipe for disaster if you plan to grow. Because the reality is grandma never got any sort of formal education as to what she's using and what's working and why it's working. She just kind of figured it out because that's what we all did back in the day. And there's now research. There is Google. There is so many wonderful resources to get highly technical training and information on what chemicals and what tools do the job right. And if you don't want to pay for them, heck, come on my blog. I'm trying to do that for you all for free. But there's plenty of other services that will do for paid as well. And there's plenty of other free resources as well if you just take the time to read them. But just go and half cocked based on what grandma told you or what you saw on some Pinterest blog, you know, it, it's damaging people's houses. And it, it absolutely is so frustrating to watch people that are presenting themselves as professionals that didn't bother to do the research. They just kind of went on what they learned from their family life and everyone's just winging it. And then they finally get their first bad damage claims and are going, well, I don't know. It's like, well, you're a professional now. You've built yourself as a company. This is on you, you know? Um, and, you know, some of the things you mentioned that in case anyone's watching, they didn't realize, and I'll underline them um 
so much of people's homes are not well sealed and maintained. Uh, people get remodeled homes or new homes and no one bothered to seal any of their grout. You said contractor's grout. That, that when people get their house remodeled or done, they they may not have it well done or sealed or epoxy grout that's a thicker grout. They just may have this very cheap, low-grade grout that's super porous. And if you don't realize that's such in your home because you don't know any better, you're just naive, you're a home consumer, you can end up with really nasty, gross-looking grout real fast if you don't have someone in your life that knows what they're doing to tell you, hey, <laughs> this is, you know, um, this is, you know, uh, inferior product, they throw it in on the quick to get the, you know, the house up and built, but you need to go get this properly sealed and handled or regrouted or whatever you need to do to get something that's going to be a more maintainable surface. Um, <coughs> and if they don't have that, comp anyone in their life, like a professional cleaning company that knows what they're doing, part of our job as professional cleaners is to consult our customers. They don't know what they're doing. That's why they're coming to us, you know, and if you don't know it either, then their house is going to get trashed. Um, so, um, I love that you bring that up. Um, and, you know, seeking out those, uh, those resources is so important, especially as a cleaning business, because your consumer has no clue and it's a moral obligation to have more of a clue than your customer. It just, it is. They're counting on you. They think you're the expert. It's not fair to be like, well, I was just a house cleaner. I don't know. I'm new into this thing. Well, you, you, you charged them as if you knew, you know? get on the stick, get, educate yourself that I totally agree. Um, and that's what I'm here for, darn it. If you, you know, if you didn't have a resource before, I hold weekly live Q and A's. If you're not sure anything you just saw on this podcast, you're like, I don't, why, why can't I use bleach? Grandma always used bleach. What does that do? Get on our weekly podcast. Uh, we have a weekly live, uh, or actually I'll let Catherine explain it in a moment. So everyone gets a technical answer, but, um, w there's education out there so that you can level up your game every week and become an expert in the service you provide um, enough to mentor your customers and tell them, oh, you're asking me to mop your floors with vinegar because some lady on um, Instagram told you it's green. Well, guess what? That's acetic acid and it's going to destroy all your stone sealants and soften your grout and make a hot, holy mess out of your house. Stop that. Uh, it's not actually gentle just because it's a food product. It's actually strongly acidic and you're doing damage. If you don't know that stuff, then you can't go out there building yourself as a trace person. Stop that. So I will let you for a minute, though, because uh, I think this very common misconception for all the clean companies out there that are doing it. Why shouldn't they bring bleach? Go. Well, bleach is highly toxic. Um, for your human being, your own body, the the um, when you inhale bleach, it actually goes into your lungs and sticks to your fat cells. Um, so physically, it's just a horrible product. Um, and you'll know that if you ever take bleach and you are in an enclosed space and you're you're inhaling the fumes, your eyes start to water. Um, but so that's that's physical. That's just your physical thing. Um, but for grout, it is at, it's at a 13 on the pH scale. 14 is the highest in the alkali. It's exceptionally high alkali. And alkali breaks down grout and caulk. Um, also, the big thing, in the, the, and it's, it's such a misconception, and it's every single human being. Every shower I walk into and I see the black, the black mold, and I'm not talking black mold behind the one, the black mold in the shower, um, the misconception is bleach is going to kill it. And I've always said to them, Okay, how long how long was it killed for? Like, when did you see it come back again? Oh, in a week. Okay, so did it kill it? Um, and the answer is no. Bleach does not kill mold. It doesn't. Extreme heat does, but not bleach. So um, bleach is, is, it breaks just like the acid. Um, alkalis and acids that are very, very high destroy grout and caulk. Um, and of course your natural stones. So, you know, people that have a slate shower or a travertine shower, if you're putting any of that stuff in there, you're just destroying the entire thing. Ceramic tile, you can't destroy it short of breaking it. I, I mean, you can do whatever you want to the ceramic tile. It's the grout that we're talking about. Um, and there was one other thing I was going to say about bleach. Oh, no, actually showers. Um, what I learned in, in why I went to Sir Grout is if you do have um, black mold in your shower, 99.9% .9 of the time, you have a break. 
So somewhere your ground is broken or your cock. One of the two. 99.9% .9 of the time. The other point, though, the one tenth is you're just a really nasty person and you just never clean your shower. So it's going to be all kinds of different colors. But for the average consumer that's fighting the battle of black in their shower, there is a grout line or a caulk line that's broken somewhere. And it might be a hairline, but it's just enough to get the moisture in there that starts the whole process. A healthy shower might get some pink in it a little bit of mildew from soap scum and body oils and just sheer humidity but black means there's a break and you know it's funny i've been preaching the same thing on my live streams but you you just said it so much more um from that restoration mindset so i i'd love again love having you here and i may even steal you for some of my lives sometime um you know it's uh it's it's refreshing to talk to another uh industry expert that's you know made the point of learning their craft um the you know Thing you talked about with bleach i think a lot of people don't realize and again people don't get educated in our industry because home consumers aren't educated on cleaning and they kind of just have manufacturers telling them stuff and they don't understand what they're being told because no one bothers but bleach in specific not only is it really alkali it's really unstable half the reason it's, it, it can't kill the mold in the grout is it never gets there um if you put bleach on a smooth non-porous surface and the you know, mold spore is stuck in that bleach on that smooth surface, yes, it can kill it in that one environment. But it's so reactive when you put it on grout lines, it's completely doing its oxidizing crazy thing right there on the outer surface. It can't get into the grout to do its job anyway. It's blowing up and becoming salt water right there on the surface. It never has a shot, even if it could, of getting deep enough to cause, you know, to kill things. Um, and people don't realize that they're like unloading half a bottle of wind of uh, Tilex on this black grout line they're mad at. And what they end up doing, like you said, is there's a crack somewhere. So they're feeding water into the grout in, and into the, the, the mold colony they're trying to kill. And all the bleach in that formula is reacting on the surface and becoming salt water and never even being bleached by the time it gets into the grout where they'd want to kill those mold spores in the first place. It can't even get there. Um, so it's destroying the grout and it's not even bringing the, you know, killing action to where you want it to go. It's like the worst plant. So, yes. <laughs> well, and on on top of it, you're just putting more moisture into the colony. <laughs> so here you've got this mold. It isn't getting more wet. It's like, like, look at the party. Oh, uh, so yes. That is, I think you have big me a big message of the thing you see that drives you bonkers. I see it with you is cleaning companies that need to commit to actually being experts at their trade and offering an amazing service by understanding what the heck they're doing. So we already talked a good bit about things like outsourcing and wishing people knew more about their business. I'm going to flip it a little bit saying, what do you wish customers understood about cleaning business more? So we now, we talked about what we wish the owners understood better. What do we wish the customers understood better? If you could, you know, without get, aggravating them because it's your Maypro clients or your Sergrad clients, if you could just reach out to the world and say, why do you people not understand? What would you, what would you explain to them about cleaning business? Um, well, on both, both of them, um, we're coming into clean. And if your house isn't prepped for the cleaning, you're just making it harder for your cleaners. So if they're in there picking up your purses and your keys that are sitting on the island, it's taking more time away from the cleaning or the restoration to actually get into doing the cleaning. So um, there is, you know, there's that whole thing. That, oh, I've got to clean before the cleaner, cleaner comes. Yes, you do. Put your shoes in the closet. Put your purse away. You know, put the dog toys in the bin so that when we come in to clean, we're actually there to do the thing you hate the most, which is mop those floors and scour your toilets. And, you know, uh, some of the things that I've seen, you know, not I'm not in the houses, but my my um, pros will send to me are horrifying that they walk into, and you know um, most cleaning companies um, restoration is different, but cleaning companies you go in there for a lot in the time. If we're there for four hours and we have to spend a half hour picking up Legos to vacuum your floor or pick your clothes up, that's going to take away from things like your baseboards, which no human being I know ever cleans their baseboards unless they have a cleaning company. Um, and, and, you know, it's, 
<laughs> I'm serious. Because I, I, I mean, for, for all these years, I've asked that question. When's the last time you clean your baseboards? And a lot of times you hear crickets in the background. And, you know, they're like, I didn't know I was supposed to clean that. <laughs> yeah. What's a baseboard? <laughs> but, um, yeah. So um, the other thing, it is a personal service. And these are human beings walking into your home. Um, something may get missed. It's not a big deal. This is not brain surgery. Nobody's dying because she missed a picture frame on your wall. It can be handled. In a case like uh, my business, we have a 24-hour policy. If you get a hold of us within 24 hours, and we initiate it with an email and a phone call, so it's not like you even have to do it yourself. We're saying, hey, how was your clean? We can get back out there and take care of it for you. But understand, the people that are going into your house are human beings. They have lives too. Um, she may have cramps. She may have had a horrible um, breakup the night before, but still made it to work. And she might be a little off her game. And um, just like you, you as a human being, give them grace. This is all stuff that can be fixed, short of like scratching a sink and stuff. But, um, you know, no, and, and each person, even though we train them all the exact same way, each person does something different. You know, somebody's going to be stronger on floors. Somebody's going to be stronger in bathrooms. Um, so I think that the clients that don't give staff grace, it, it kind of bothers me because you want it, you know, so understand that these people are in your home, scouring your toilets, respect them. And if something, yeah, is blatantly missed, yes, give us a call. It'll be fixed. Somebody will be out there the next day or two to take care of it. But, you know, she missed one baseboard. Come on, you know, it'll be taken care of. <laughs> You know, spot on to all of it. Um, you're so, you said so many things I want to just bookmark because you're so spot on. Um, first, in terms of education to the customer about the importance of housekeeping before house cleaning. That's how I differentiate the terminology so people get the difference. Housekeeping is the return of order. House cleaning is the removal of soil. It's on you as the consumer to return the order because you know where everything goes. Your house cleaner has no stinking clue where these dirty clothes go or if they're dirty and they're clean or this pile is clean clothes you mean to fold or dirty clothes you need to wash. They don't know. They are not. They don't live here. You do. So if your stuff's bestrewn all over your house, it's asking someone to play psychic and guess where your stuff goes or take all your junk and try to neatly display your junk back to you and that eats away your cleaning time. And either we got to charge you more, stay longer, or we do less for you. And either way, you lost out rather than just pick up your junk. You know, it's not cleaning before the cleaning lady. It's housekeeping before they house clean. They've got to return order so that you can focus on soil removal, not guessing, are these clean and dirty clothes? Let me sniff test them. I mean, like, that's not a fair plan. Like, get your stuff out of the way, you know? Um, and the other piece you mentioned about showing people grace Oh my God, for any business. I mean, yes, cleaning business because we're in your home as an intimate service. I think it's even more so. But any business right now, our, you know, our planet, but our country, our planet has been through some really rough years. It's it's been a it's been a ride. And, you know, I hope out of all of this, we've learned that people are human and are going through stuff and you never know what's going on in people's lives. And extending them the grace that you want for when your life's going crummy. You know, if they've had a bad day or a rotten phone call or their kid's sick and they push themselves to get to work today to try to take care of you because they're good people and then they were human and they're not robots and they missed a something, you can get that addressed with grace. Um, you, you just have to have built a strong relationship with your company. Now, admittedly, in fairness to these customers, I think one of the big things that, you know, we talk about what companies are doing wrong we didn't touch on is there's a lot of companies that make it a fight to get things fixed. You are amazing. You have a 24-hour guarantee you mentioned where if there's anything they find that they don't feel is what they were hoping for, they can reach out to you and you're going to take care of it. You're running things right. That's awesome. Unfortunately, there are businesses out there that will say, oh, well, we were there for three hours. That's your problem. And no, I think we did it fine. And they're all defensive and cocky and won't help. So I think a lot of consumers have been trained that the only way they get help is if they're grouchy and nasty and go full Karen mode. And I think that their instinct is, oh, the house didn't come out right. 
my job is to scream and holler on the phone right now if I want them to take, help me because otherwise they won't help me. And I think we have to work on as an industry, especially in cleaning, telling people from the get go that they don't need to do that with us, that we have a plan in place. You're going to be able to reach out to us and say, this wasn't my personal taste. It was not even like it's bad. It's just not how I want my home to look. And we got your back. We'll be out there. We'll take care of this for you. That conversation in, from day one and then living up to that should allow them to be kind to your employees and say, hey, this isn't the way I want things to look. And then be kind to your staff and say, hey, the clean, cleaner that came out, this wasn't what I was hoping for. Can you fix it? And if you stand behind your work and you do it, no one had to yell at all. You know, I mean, it, it's just about setting that relationship and that respect and that trust. And it goes both ways. You know, the customer does have to treat us with respectfully, but we also have to make clear beforehand, we're going to stand behind our work and you're not going to have to scream to get help. You know, um, and if you do those things together, then the screaming should never happen. There should just be, oh, you're a human. You missed the baseboards today because you, you know, my house was really extra dirty and you got distracted by some other stuff. I get it. But they're missed. Can you come fix it? Yeah, I got you. I come back and I fix it. And everyone's happy. You know, um, we're humans. And I, I love that you are communicating that because I think the more we can help customers get it, that if they build these relationships with their cleaning staff and are able to have an honest back and forth, there's no reason to ever leave a company. You can just give them honest feedback, have them correct it, learn from their mistakes and do better. Now, if they're not willing to learn and they're making the same mistakes over and over, at a certain point, you know, you're not, you're done with that service. But as long as they're doing their part to document and improve over time, heck yeah, that's just about building a healthy relationship. It's like you don't ditch someone on the first date because they said something slightly off. You're like, oh, this person's got all these wonderful qualities. I'm going to learn from each other and we're going to learn how to communicate better. That's like what everyone does in relationship counseling. Learn to communicate better with your cleaning company. You know, you've got to learn how to communicate with someone you're going to be in a long-term relationship with. And if you're in a cleaning a relationship with your cleaner and you are if you're in a business they're in your home they, they are part of your lives you're in this relationship you need to learn how to have authentic communication express your wants and needs have them taken authentically and not with judgment and get your needs met if you can't do that you shouldn't be working with this person if you don't have that level of trust built up they shouldn't be in your home um but that's a two-way street and everyone's gonna play their part but you know i think it's so spot on that our industry has to do a better job of explaining to customers how to get their needs met and how to get supported, but customers also need to do their part and not go full Karen when that company has told them, I got you, I got a plan, I will support you. You don't have to scream to get your knees bent. You know, um, oh, and I remembered the thing that I, I wanted to airmark as the uh, other thing I want to say for you. I love how you mentioned how different cleaners have their own strengths. I think this is something that people don't get at all. When you train, you train with great training. I know you do. You're very detail oriented. You love your craft, but people are people. It's like when you go to those paint night parties and everyone's learning to paint the same silly flower at this paint night. But if you look at the paintings at the end of the night, they all look different, even though they were seen in the same room with the same paints and the same instructions at the same time. Everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses and the way their brains work. It's gonna come out a little different you know they'll all look like a sunflower but they're gonna be different sunflowers when you hire cleaners i don't care how hard you train them they're not robots they're all gonna produce their own version of that sunflower in your home and if it's not what you're hoping for it's okay to be honest and say this doesn't meet my needs but then have a conversation about what needs to change you know how how no, how much darker do you want the petals how many more petals do you need rather than ah oh, i give up this is a terrible painter i need a new painter no, they just did their own style and they just need some feedback. You know, um, I think it's so important to recognize even highly skilled cleaners just may have a different style that you're not used to. And you can give them some feedback. They can learn you and give you what you need. You know, um, so I think we're at the end of the interview, except for our last two, which are our little fun questions. They're not really business. They're just sort of like silliness. So first... Do you have a favorite cleaning product or cleaning hack or cleaning t technique that you love? I, I tried not to use the word hack. I've been educated by a couple of people that they feel like hack means like, you know, last minute trick that isn't a real way to do it. But I mean like, you know, things that like products you love or things you know work that you're like, oh, I, when I found that, that was like, that's like my favorite. It's not, it's not a cleaning product, um, but 
showers and bathtubs, shower curtains and shower doors. People need to realize that um, the best way to combat mildew in a shower is proper ventilation. And the ventilation, um, even in the state of Florida where I live, they stink. I, I, I mean, I can go into a McMansion, it's the same crappy ventilation as my normal house. Um, so one of the best things for your shower and or bathtub, the day of use, the door and or shower curtain should stay open throughout the door, day to ventilate. And that will actually help a lot in eliminating mold and mildew buildup. And like I said, it's not even a clean price. It's just that simple. And if it's a shower door, shut it at night so you don't walk into it when you go into the bathroom in the middle of the night. Um, and, you know, it's, I mean, it's pretty simple. That's a huge piece of advice. I don't think people realize that at all. Great advice. Yeah. And the other thing um, in all my years, the most pristine showers I've ever seen, and I won't do this. I'm telling you right now, I'm not that person, are the people that dry their showers every time they use it. Simply drying it. Um, at five o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, my ass is not drying the shower. It's just not happening. Um, but the people, the people that do, when we go in, it, it's, it's just amazing. Um, so that, that task, if somebody has the energy to do it every single time they shower, it will add years of life to a shower. It, ventilation in general, your spot, you know, honestly, I love that advice. That, that, that is not a clean hack. That is like a home ownership hack of ventilation, ventilation, ventilation in bathrooms, um, Clean your vents, people. I can't tell you people have like these rickety old vents in these old homes that have never seen the better side of a wipe down. And it's not even moving air anymore because it's so nasty in there. You know, um, or they've got windows that are painted shut because the house is old and all that stuff. Like, yes, drying the air out so that the mold can't grow. Huge, awesome advice. Love it. Wonderful one. And clearly from someone that has dealt with the aftermath of when people don't. So awesome work. Um, this is my very last one. Last question, for the sake of our listeners' entertainment, do you have any fun stories? You know, um, the either heartwarming, you know, we saved a dog's life or, oh no, we lost the dog or, you know, whatever it is, you know, any wild stories from the real lives of uh, house cleaners, you know, keep it PG-13. I, I, I'm, not doing a, I'm not doing house cleaning at the park, but um, and I'm sure you've sure you got those stories too. I'll probably do that at some point, maybe, but um, but not yet. What any any good juicy stories? Um, I, I I have a ton, and a lot of them are past PG thirteen. But one of my all time favorites is we had a client who um had an attack cat. This the most vicious animal we have ever dealt with, and you know this is we walk into houses with huge dogs. This cat would and i didn't matter who the cleaner was would hide under the bed and literally attack the cleaner in the vacuum so that obviously you know claws and teeth not a good thing um so you know we had the discussion you know the first time we happened we kind of blew it off but then you know another person went in and it's the same thing so we had the discussion with our client and we had to make um better for years the only reason why we don't have her she had to move um to the other side of, of the state but she um we had the discussion with her and what we did is we found a cleaner that could come in earlier than our normal time because this client worked really early in the morning and what she did for us is she put the cat in the closet and my pro would arrive at 7 30 go in do the clean take all of her gear outside the apartment door and literally go back and crack the door and run out of the house. But it was a win-win. It was a win-win for all of it. You know, she got her house clean. We didn't get mauled. The cat did eventually get locked, you know, or got loose. But um, yeah, that was one of them. I'm sorry. I just had this wonderful visual of your amazing employee running from Cujo the cat at full speed at 8 o'clock in the morning. What a way to start your day. God love her. Um, you know, but this real life, I mean, people's pets are such a big part of this service. You know, you can either have ones that, you know, pee in the carpet the second they see you. You can have ones that are trying to like, you know, come attack you. You can have ones that are, you know, running for the hills because they like to take a good jog every time you open the door. You know, um, it's real life and, you know, having strong record keeping and having a healthy relationship with your customers where you can say, hey, yeah, my employees, you know, they aren't for, up for getting mauled today. Can we find an alternate solution and have them have a 
rational plan, like I'll lock him in the closet if you, you know, remember to let him out at the end, that takes some trust because now they're worried about, are you going to forget and leave this cat locked up in the closet all day? You have to have a company that you trust and you work with, you have a good working relationship with. Um, but these are real life issues. And I think, you know, that problem solving and that being there to support the customer is a great thing, but also being there to support your employees so they don't get, you know, scratched either. I think there's a lot of companies that aren't as good to their workers. They're like, oh, you can figure it out. You'll sort it out. It's like, no, I'm getting bit by a cat and I don't get paid enough for this nonsense and make it stop. You know, um, you know, there's a certain point where you have to be there for your worker and stand up for them too and say, nope, they don't get to deal with that today. That's not safe. Um, you know, and, you know, stand up for your staff and get them what they need. So I love that you did that. Uh, but uh, I will just make sure she has good running shoes though. <laughs> but a uh, wonderful story to end on. Thank you. Um, shameless plug. Uh, go ahead. Where are you located? What areas do you service? Uh, give, so in case any of your customers see this, where can they find your amazing grout restoration and cleaning services? Um, so our Sir Grout, we are in Central Florida. We service um, the villages, Lake County and Seminole County. Um, and we cross over into Volusia County. My Made Pro office, um, we service East Orlando, Orange County, Seminole County, and a portion of Lake County. Go, guys. Don't hesitate. Don't collect $200. If you need cleaning service or restoration work in those marketplaces, this is who you want in charge. And clearly, she knows her stuff. And for everyone else listening, um, if you want more cleaning advice like this, do not forget to like, subscribe, and follow. We're going to continue to have these amazing interviews. We're going to have weekly live streams. You can ask questions direct from me. Um, we're going to have blog posts and videos. And apparently we're going to have a fun gripe session where we can talk about all the horrible home remodeling plans people have. We're going to have it all because our goal is making sure everyone that follows us knows the ins and outs of cleaning the right way. No more of this clean talk nonsense of telling people to mop their floors with Tide Pods. We're coming with real facts and real information from the field to help you clean things right. So like, subscribe, and follow. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Catherine. You're an amazing guest, and we'll look forward to seeing you all in the next episode. Bye, everybody. <laughs>